Hello, it's Saturday, June 24, uh, 2013, and this is Cancer Update number 11. Um, the first thing I want to do is acknowledge um, some, of the, some of the things I've said in previous videos. I, I watched a ton of my videos back last night, and I noticed that some of the things I say are at best misleading on occasion, and sometimes they're outright incorrect. Uh, I'm going to correct those wherever I can, but I'm not going to correct them universally. And the reason for that is I'm on a journey and, um, damn it, um, the journey um, has a lot of uncertainty. God damn. The journey has a lot of uncertainty about it. And what that means is that um, sometimes I have a belief of something along the way and later on it turns out, God, turns out to be wrong. And that is part of the journey. And now that I know that, now that I know that I'm not getting out of this alive, um, the purpose of this journal is to help those that come along after me. And for the people that come along after me, I want you to realise that it's a journey of discovery and at times it's an absolute journey of disappointment. And um, that is the journey. The journey... It, it's not, you don't know everything at the start and you half know things along the way and then you find out you don't know things along the way. And that is, that is where I'm at. So just to clear up a couple of things, in cancer update number 10, I said that I'd met a oncology specialist that specialises in PMP um, that used the word curable. I thought there was only one definition for the word curable. I thought curable meant um, when we're done, it's finished, it's never coming back, it'll be like it never happened. And I think a lot of people viewing this right now will think that is what the word curable means. And certainly when that specialist said it to me, that's what I heard. And when you, if you go back and watch Cancer Update 10, you'll see in the excitement that I, that I bring to that, that in my head, that's what I thought curable meant. I now know that there's actually a medical definition of curable that is um, no reoccurrence within five years, or at least no readmission. So you might have it, you just haven't readmitted yourself to hospital. I'm going to put a link below in the description to this video to show you that medical definition. Um, I think if you're on a cancer journey, it's important for you to know that your definition of curable and their definition of curable are not the same thing. And... Um, that unfortunately um, gave me what I'd describe as a, as a fair amount of false hope um, a week ago. And um, it only got worse as it turned out. So, okay, so that's the first thing I've cleared up. So I've cleared up the definition of, um, of curable. So the specialist, the PMP specialist contacted me yesterday, which was Friday the 23rd of June, 2023. And... Um, I had been processing in my mind, I'm about to get ready and do this um, HIPEC surgery. So that's um, hy hypothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. If you look it up, you'll, there's tons of stuff online. It's H-I-P-E-C. You can find heaps of stuff online for it. It's an extremely invasive surgery and it does have a fatality rate of 1.5% on the table. So 1.5% of people that go into surgery for it, don't come out alive. So, um, and that's just the surgery, let alone the, the recovery and then whatever quality of life you have after that. So I was expecting to have this phone call from the um, specialist yesterday and I was expecting him to offer me the HIPEC surgery and I had gone through all of that agonising um, questioning within myself and, and you know, preparing, watching the videos of what the actual surgical procedure is and all of that um, drama. And I, I had actually come to a place where I said, okay, I think I think I want to, I think I can do this. I think I can um, have the surgery. It's going to take me 
three to six months to get over it. Um, the lifestyle complications that you have afterwards are can be quite bad. There's things like um, uh, incontinence, um, needing um, stoma bags, um, um, sexual dysfunction, um, sleep disorders. There's a whole list of, of things that um, you can have at the end of high surgery. But I thought, okay, I can do this. I'll effectively um, write off the next six months of my life to do this, but then I'll be cured, right? And that's the thing. I was going, but then I'll be cured. And then I got the phone call from the specialist and um, things went downhill. There's a thing called the peritoneal cancer index or otherwise known as the PCI. Uh, I'm gonna put a link to it down in the description, but very simply, the abdomen is divided up into 13 areas and each area gets a score out of three. So 13 times three means the total index value is 39. When I had my conversation with my specialist, um, it came up in conversation. The first thing I said to him was, hey, and you'll remember this from one of the old videos. I said, hey, you said you're gonna have a really good look at my um, appendix, but you haven't had a look at my appendix and what, what's going on there? You made it sound like it was really important. You haven't looked at my appendix. And he then explained to me, um, Paul, I've been doing this for decades and I've opened up a lot of abdomens and the moment I opened you up, I realized that you were inoperable. And to push the laparoscope up to, to your appendix was at best gonna tear a few things, at worst would only seed the cancer further. So I didn't go and look at your, um, your appendix. I just said, and I'd researched what a PCI was by that stage. So I said, what's my PCI score? And he said, 39. And I said, sorry, 39 out of 39? He said, yeah, yeah, you've got it. Um, you've got it completely. You've got it 100% in every, in every area. And then he said, so I'm unable to offer you the high pec surgery. And at this stage, I started losing my balance. I felt, it's like that feeling when you fall backwards off a chair, you know, and you're grasping for something to hold on to, but you can't find it. It's, it's like that, but in your head. And um, he said, Paul, you're, um, you would need six months of chemotherapy before you would be... Um, before you would have a PCI score low enough for me to consider the um, high pec operation to be medically indicated. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna refer you to a um, chemotherapy oncologist um, down your way, so at Murdoch Hospital, which is closer to where I live. And um, uh, I'll talk to you again in six months. And I, I was, I was struggling at that point because here's the thing. Now the whole scenario changes because I, um, I have signet ring cell um, adenocarcinoma, which has a very low life expectancy. Um, I'll chuck the graph up on a, on a picture in picture. So I guess it's down here now. And um, I'm that low, light blue, oh, sorry, dark blue line down the bottom um, that shows the survival stats for signet, real carcino signet ring cell carcinoma. Um, the trouble is that graph there is for all PCI scores. So some of the people on that graph have PCI scores of five out of 39. So those people with scores of five out of 39, those are the ones that live right out to the right hand side of that graph. Um, my score is 39 out of 39. So I'm those poor suckers on the left-hand side of that graph that um, don't make it very far. So the problem for me is the specialist is saying, hey, go and spend six months wrecking your body with chemotherapy and then come back to me and I'll wreck your body for six months with high pec, and then you might get 
one month with a series of debilitating um, lifestyle features like being incontinent and um, not being able to sleep at night and then you're going to die because the statistics are telling us that. And um, that's, that's the reality I've, I've got that's being offered by my oncologists. The alternative is uh, to say no to all um, treatment and just get therapeutic drains on my abdomen and um, wait until one of my organs will eventually, because at the moment what I've got is I've got mucinous tumours in my ascites. The ascites is swimming around all in my stump, in my abdomen. So that means those mucinous tumours are getting washed around in a washing machine and are now all over every single organ in my abdomen as a precancerous surface tumour. Now, over time, they're going to go from precancerous surface tumours to cancerous internal tumours. So what is eventually going to happen is one of my internal abdominal organs is going to go from precancer to cancer. And depending on which organ it is, is, um, is pretty much going to determine how I'm going to die if I, if I go down the no treatment route. So if it's the pancreas, I'll die of, um, you know, pancreatic cancer. If it's liver, I'll die of liver cancer. If I get a bowel obstruction, it'll be, it'll be the bowel. But it'll be something in my abdomen. You know, something will fail. And based on the statistics, it's going to fail quite quickly. It's going to fail within six months, I'd say. So I can either wreck my body for six months with chemo, hope I'm alive, wreck my body with high pick, hope I'm alive, and then have a shitty life until I die. Or I can choose to not take um, treatment and just get therapeutic drains on my ascites and um, get on some good drugs and um, good therapeutic drugs, I mean, um, and wait for the first um, bit of um, early organ failure. And then because of the wonderful legislations we have here in Western Australia, um, there's the Voluntary Assisted Dying Act of 2019 um, that funnily enough, I, I didn't actually get involved in putting it live with the health department of WA, but the project manager that putting it live was in the desk next to me. Um, and her and I used to have lively discussions about it because um, euthanasia was always something that my parents are really keen on. Or not, sorry, not keen on, but they were um, very open to the idea of it. And um, so um, she and I used to have really lively discussions about um, putting the VAD legislation live um, out there. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of pleased that I was working for the health department as, and, and you know, tangentially associated with putting that software live. And I'm certainly very grateful to the West Australian um, government for having the, the the guts and the foresight to put that legislation um, into action. I think it's I think it's very humane. So the question is, do I go through all that um, crap with the chemo and the high pec only to die anyway, or do I just have therapeutic drains and then when I have early organ failure, um, use the voluntary assisted dying legislation to um, to punch out and. Um, uh, end my life on my terms with my dignity, um, dignity intact, you know, and it, that, that if I go down that route, I'm, I'm guessing, but I probably have three or four months going forwards that will be of a relatively okay um, quality of life. And um, then I'll probably have one month, which will be a bit shit, and then I'll pick a date to punch out and then I'll punch out. Um, now, this is obviously a pretty big decision, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to stand here now and say what my decision is because the truth is I haven't made it and I'm not going to make it until, firstly, I've spoken to the chemo um, oncologist at Murdoch um, Hospital. Secondly, I'm going to talk to a psychiatrist and, and just see, um, you know, see, see what, how my head should be at for, for this and, um, uh, you know, may, and maybe... I just need to think it through. Um, choosing, choosing your pathway to death um, feels like something that should be done carefully. So um, that's what I'm going to do. And uh, yeah, so that's the end of Cancer Update 11. Um, I'll talk to you again when I've got more, more news. See you later.